Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com, and this is Antiwar News for Thursday, November 24th, 2022. Um, it's Thanksgiving, so happy Thanksgiving, everybody, to all the Americans out there, uh, which is most of you. Um, the first story at the top of Antiwar.com, the U.S. announces a new weapons package for Ukraine. This one is worth $400 million. So the Pentagon announced this on Wednesday, and the package includes heavy machine guns that are meant to counter drones, and it's mostly ammunition, ammunition for the HIMARS rocket launch systems and for the National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile Systems, which are an air defense system that the U.S. just started delivering to Ukraine. So that's going to get some munitions, as well as uh, the howitzers that the U.S. has been sending, um, there's mortar rounds, uh, anti-radiation missiles, and some tactical vehicles, and then small arms ammunition. Also, over 200 generators, so I guess that's related to Ukraine's the issue that they're having with their power grid, which I'll get more into in another story. Um, but the uh, heavy machine guns that they're sending, this is the first time I, I think I've seen them send these specific types. It says that they have thermal Im imagery sites to counter drones. So I guess they're saying saying they could shoot down drones with these big machine guns. Um, the 400 million it's being sent to Ukraine through the presidential drawdown authority, which allows President Biden to send arms straight from US military stockpiles. So that allows them to ship them just right away um, to Ukraine. They don't have to purchase the weapons. They don't have to deal with contracts and things like that. They could just send them right away. And the Pentagon said that this is the 26th drawdown of equipment from U.S. military stockpiles. So the 26th time that they've done this. And the Pentagon says that they've pledged over $19 billion in military equipment for Ukraine since Russia invaded. And that's just in the arms, the weapons that they're sending. You know, there's other types of military aid, training and things like that. And there also might be some weapons that they're sending over that we don't know about. Um, it's just big money. And this aid, it's still being pulled from uh, previous aid packages that have been approved by Congress. They still have some to, some room to work with there, but the White House is asking for $37.7 billion, and they want that to be approved and ready to go before the new Congress is sworn in in January. Also, on, on Wednesday, the Pentagon released a fact sheet and this details all of the weapons that they've sent Ukraine so far. Um, 19, 19.7 billion is the number, is the amount that they've given since President Biden came into office back in January 2021. But they're saying since Russia invaded, it's been more than 19 billion. So it's it's a lot and it's all detailed here. Um, all right. So more aid. The next story here, senators are looking for the Biden administration to send advanced drones. So a group of bipartisan senators is urging the Biden administration to provide Ukraine with advanced MQ-1C Gray Eagle drones that would give Kiev longer range capability. The Biden administration has been hesitant to send the drones due to the risk of escalation with Russia and cons over concerns that the sensitive technology in the drones could end up in the wrong hands. So the Wall Street Journal recently reported that the Biden administration has decided not to provide the drones, although other reporting disputed that claim and said a final decision hadn't been made. In a letter to the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, 16 senators from you know both Republicans and Democrats expressed concern over the reports that said the administration had declined to send this type of drone, this MQ-1C. And the senators asked the administration to give careful reconsideration to the Ukrainian request. The letter was read, was led by Senator Joni Ernst, Republican from Iowa, and it was signed by many members of the Senate Armed Services Committee, including James Inhofe, Republican from Oklahoma. Uh, he's on his way out. He's resigning, so he's not going to be in Congress anymore uh, come January. Um but the senator said, and it was also signed by, I saw Lindsey Graham was on there, so uh, a lot of hawks here. But still, 16, a bipartisan group of senators, it's a decent amount. Um, there has been a lot of pressure from Congress in general on the Biden administration to give Ukraine these longer-range capabilities. 
because these MQ-1Cs, they would be, it would be a pretty huge escalation in U.S. military aid. I mean, they might as well give them fighter jets um, because these drones, they can be armed with Hellfire missiles and they can fly for up to 30 hours. So, you know, that means they could strike pretty deep into Russia if that's what they uh, decided to do. And so the U.S. has provided Ukraine any kind of weapon that it gives them that has a longer range that could potentially hit Russian territory. Uh, they, they say, you know, Ukraine has given them, uh, has told them that they won't use it to target Russian territory, with the exception of Crimea, because even though Russia has controlled Crimea since 2014, Ukraine and the U.S. don't recognize it. Um, but then again, you know, there have been a lot of Ukrainian attacks in Belgorod, which is a Russian region that borders Ukraine in Western Russia. So who knows what weapons are, they're using to do that. Um, and so really, it seems that like, though, for, for the Pentagon, the big concern about sending these drones is that the, is the technology issue. And there was a report recently that said, the U.S. was considering modifying the drone slightly just so the technology is a little different, uh, I guess. So uh, then that way, if they get shot down or something, they wouldn't be too worried about Russia having these drones. Um, but this is, you know, they're really pushing this. A lot of other members of Congress want the Biden administration to send jets and things like that, really heavy equipment, long range missiles that have a range of 200 miles. And I think we're going to keep seeing this pressure, even with the change. In Congress, I don't think it's going to impact that too much. All right, the next one here. So Russian strikes on energy infrastructure leave most of Ukraine without power. So Russian missiles pounded energy infrastructure across Ukraine again on Wednesday, leaving most, most Ukrainians, the vast majority of them, without power, according to the country's energy ministry. So they're saying the energy, the Ukrainian energy ministry said that the missile attacks led to a temporary blackout of all nuclear, most thermal, and hydroelectric power plants. Power transmission facilities were also hit. So the ministry said that as a result, the vast majority of electricity consumers in Ukraine are facing outages and emergency blackouts. It said that the work, work was being done to repair the blackouts, but it, you know it's going to take time. Uh, Moldova also experienced blackouts as a result of the strikes because much of its energy infrastructure is connected to Ukraine's. They said they had massive power outages across the country. <clears throat> um, so last week, so just to show the damage, uh, you know, that these Russian strikes are really doing to Ukraine's grid. It, it was last week after some Russian strikes, Ukraine's prime minister said that you know, they disabled about half of the country's energy infrastructure. And they told the U.S. And, and their other Western backers that they might not be able to recover from more missile strikes on the grid. And now here we have a lot more. Um, and, you know, the situation, it, it's, it's a really desperate situation now for Ukrainian civilians because, you know, temperatures are already very low in Ukraine and they're, they are continuing to drop as winter is approaching and the head of a there's a private energy provider that said ukrainians will most likely have to live with blackouts until the end of march so through the winter um and that means because as they're repairing the stuff they have to do rolling blackouts and it's just not going to be pleasant there's probably going to be another big influx in refugees trying to leave ukraine either for europe or russia um, it's just a really bleak situation. And Russia didn't, they didn't uh, do strikes like this until pretty recently. This really started in October. And, you know, it's been pretty, they've kept it up. Uh, you know, there's lulls for a few days, but then they come back uh, with big strikes like this. And according to Russia, um, they're doing this until Ukraine is ready to negotiate. We'll get more into that in the next one. Uh, but and this really, it started uh, after the truck bombing of the Kerch Bridge, which connects Crimea to the Russian mainland. That's when, right after that was when Russia started these strikes. Whether they had to, planned on doing them before that or or, or not, uh, it's not clear. But um, it does show that the attacks on Crimea, uh, you know, Russia really does react to them pretty strongly. All right. 
so in the next one we have, unfortunately, despite, you know, the hardship that Ukrainians are going to face, there's still no sign of peace talks, even though there's been an increase in U.S. and Russia dialogue. So um, I think, as I say in this story, that Russia's continued strikes on Ukraine's energy infrastructure like that, I mean, it shows that there hasn't, that there's not talks going on, like back channel talks, I, I believe. And the Kremlin said on Wednesday that it has uh, it hasn't had any interaction with the U.S. about the subject of peace talks, because um, we know that William Burns, the CIA director, he recently met with Russia's spy chief. Jake Sullivan was having some talks. Uh, the U.S. and Russia are going to begin arms control talks on the new START treaty at the end of the month. But there, Russia is saying that there's not no conversation about peace talks for Ukraine. And then Russia's representative to the U.N., said that Russia is going to continue the military action until the government of until Zelensky's government is ready for talks. So he said that Russia will keep up the military pressure, quote, until the Kiev regime takes a realistic position, which will make it possible to discuss and try to settle those problems, which have prompted us to launch the special military operation, end quote. So that's, um, he also said, you know, like that this, that the war has to end in talks eventually. And it's just a matter of time until the Ukrainians decide to talk. So while Milley, uh, the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff, he's the highest ranking uh, officer in the U S military. He has voiced support for a diplomatic solution, but his view is not popular uh, among other Biden administration officials. And after he made his remarks, the Biden administration went and reassured Ukraine, you know, that peace talks don't need to happen now and that they would continue supporting the fight against Russia. And Milley has said that, too. You know, if, if there aren't talks, the U.S. is going to keep supporting this. Um, and, you know, there's always the chance that there's back channel talks going on, uh, as we know there are between the U.S. and Russia. But what I mean when it comes to peace talks, when discussing a settlement uh, but the Russian ambassador to the UK said Tuesday that there have been no what he called informal negotiations. So he said, quote, informal negotiations are not going on because Kiev is very stubborn. Kiev has an illusion that it can win this war. It is pure illusion. It is not possible, but Kiev cannot reject having weapons and money from the West, end quote. So we know Zelensky recently softened his public stance on negotiations, but all he did really was say, because he before that, his policy was that no talks with Russia while Putin is president, but he changed that. But he still is demanding a Russian withdrawal, reparations, and war crimes trials as preconditions for negotiations. So just total non-starters. Um, this, I just wanted to give an update on you know what Russia is saying about the negotiations, because um, they talk about it a lot. It seems like more so than than you the U.S. does. Um, but this is what they're saying. So to me, I think uh, it doesn't look like there's any any chance that there's peace talks going on. And I would be surprised if they if they happen soon. Um, I had my hopes up there a little bit when we learned about all this U.S. Russia engagement that was going on and what Millie said. But it doesn't seem like. Uh, any progress is going to be made. I mean, hopefully something changes, but uh, right now it doesn't look good. All right, the next one here, the European Union's parliament labels Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. So they voted to do this on Wednesday in a vote of 494 to 58 with 44 members not voting. But really, it's a symbolic move. They don't have any legal framework for the state sponsor of terror label like the U.S. does. So if the U.S. designates a country as a state sponsor of terror, it opens them up for all these sanctions. Uh, it really expands sanctions on them. And currently, only Cuba, North Korea, Iran, and Syria have this label. Um, so the U.S. designation has a lot more weight than this EU one. It, this doesn't really mean uh, much. But, you know, responding to it, Zelensky is calling on the U.S. again to, to, do, to label Russia as a state sponsor of terror. And I think we might see some pressure increase on the Biden administration because Congress was really pushing for it a few months ago. And I think now after the EU did this, they're probably going to try again. Uh, but the Biden administration, the White House said in September that they have ruled out the idea that they're not going to do it. And um, 
they're saying because of all the sanctions they already put on Russia, and it's true because the U.S. has already put so many sanctions on Russia that the label wouldn't have really any impact on Moscow. It could potentially open up sanctions on countries, more sanctions on countries that still that do business with Russia. Um, and really what it would be, though, is more symbolic than anything again, because if you look at the look at the countries that are on there, Cuba, North Korea, Iran and Syria, I mean, they're all basically under U.S. embargoes um, and, and reversing these designations is very difficult. The Obama administration lifted the Cuba one, which was first implemented by the Reagan administration. So it was there for decades. And then the Trump administration put it back on because all the steps that Obama did to open up with Cuba, Trump reversed. And he was able to do that because Obama never fully did it. He never fully normalized with Cuba. Um, so just I'm pretty sure everything he he changed, Trump reversed and Biden hasn't he's lifted some very minor restrictions on Cuba, but nothing significant. So after what, how, how many 60 years, I guess now of, uh, or is it longer than that? Yeah, it's, it's 60 years now of being under a U.S. embargo for Cuba. Um, and of course, Russia denounced the move. Um, and some EU member states already labeled Russia as a terror sponsor on their own. Again, that doesn't it doesn't really mean anything. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland did that. All right. What do we got next here? Um, the Pentagon says that Turkish airstrikes in Syria threaten the safety of US troops. So the Pentagon said this on Wednesday that Turkish airstrikes against Kurdish militants in northeast Syria threaten the safety of U.S. troops in the region, as Erdogan, the Turkish president, vowed that the operation will continue. So this was a statement from the Pentagon spokesman, Pat Ryder. He said, quote, recent airstrikes in Syria di directly threatened the safety of U.S. personnel who are working in Syria with local partners to defeat ISIS and maintain custody of more than 10,000 ISIS detainees, end quote. So Ryder's comments mark the strongest condemnation from the U.S. of Turkey's operations in northern Syria and Iraq, which began with major airstrikes on Sunday. So that's kind of the strongest thing against them that we've seen. But even in that statement, I mean, he doesn't even mention Turkey by name. Uh, it's not very strong. And on Tuesday, the White House said that Turkey has every right to defend themselves against these Kurdish militants. Um, so again, it's still, it do, just doesn't seem like they're coming out strongly at all against what uh, Turkey's doing there. So, but this does really show, you know, the danger that the situation in Syria is so volatile because of Turkey, the Kurds, uh, some ISIS remnants, and then all these other groups and of Al Qaeda in the Northwest and Idlib, um, that the U.S. troops being there, you know, the bases often come under rocket fire, but it's just a serious tripwire to drag us into a bigger conflict. And the U.S. has about 1,000 troops there, and they back the SDF, which is the Kurdish group. And really, you know, they say this is about ISIS, but it's not about ISIS. It's about Syria. It's about Damascus. It's about controlling. They're able to control one third of the country by backing these Kurds. And keeping Syria under these brutal sanctions, punishing the country because Assad never uh, went, they never was able, were able to throw him out. It's just a war, an economic war against Syrian civilians as a UN special rapporteur recently detailed how much these sanctions are hurting civilians. So that's what it's about. Um, but uh, again, highlighting the danger, a Turkish drone strike on Tuesday, hit a base in the region that is used jointly by the SDF and the U.S., uh, but the U.S. said none of its personnel were at the location at the time of the bombing. U.S. Central Command said that the closest Turkish airstrike hit about 10, uh, 12 to 18 miles away from U.S. troops. Russia also has a presence in the region, and an SDF official said that a Russian base was hit by a Turkish strike. Russia is calling on Turkey to avoid a full-scale offensive, but Erdogan is warning that more, more is coming. <clears throat> so that's another risk about U.S. operations in Syria, is that it risks of conflict with Russia. So Erdogan said on Wednesday that the airstrikes Turkey launched this week are just the beginning, and he hinted at a ground invasion. So he's still threatening a ground invasion. 
He said, quote, while we press ahead with air raids uninterrupted, we will crack down on terrorists also by land at the most convenient time for us, end quote. So Turkey is claiming a very high death toll in their airstrikes, which have continued, you know, on Tuesday and Wednesday. So they're still going on. But the SDF is disputing the numbers. Turkey claimed Wednesday that they killed 254 what they call terrorists. That's a pretty high number. But the SDF has said only three of its fighters were killed along with 18 civilians. So that's such a huge discrepancy. Who knows what the real number is? Um, Okay, so the next one here, um, this is from the Electronic Intifada, and this is about Ben Gavir, who is the far-right Israeli lawmaker who's become, you know, the kingmaker who Netanyahu needs to form a coalition government. And he's a real extremist. And um, this is from Maureen Claire Murphy at the Electronic Intifada. Ben Gavir pours fuel on Jerusalem and West Bank violence. So there was a big, there was a bombing in uh, Jerusalem on Wednesday that killed a, a teenager. So Israel's new far-right kingmaker, Itamir Ben Gavir, called for the extrajudicial executions of Palestinian resistance leaders after a teen was killed and others were injured in two bombings in Jerusalem on Wednesday. So he's calling for uh, resumption of targeted killings of suspected, uh, you know, of the suspected bo- people that set off these bombs, uh, which is something that Israel used to do a lot more. Um, and these deadly bombings came after five Palestinian children were killed by Israeli occupation forces in the West Bank this month, including a boy shot in the heart. Uh, Late Tuesday, so right before this bombing, a Palestinian boy was shot and killed. Over the weekend, tens of thousands of Jewish settlers headed by Ben Gavir descended on Hebron, attacking Palestinians and their property in one of the largest settler marches in memory. Meanwhile, Palestinian gunmen in the northern West Bank city of Jenin were holding the body of a young Druze citizen of Israel who was hospitalized in the city after being injured in a car crash on Tuesday. The double bombing in Jerusalem on Wednesday was the first first such incident in the city in years. Um, so it's a pretty volatile situation. There's a lot of violence. A lot of Palestinians have been killed. Now you have this bombing. An Israeli teenager was killed. Lots of settler attacks. And uh, as this new really uh, extreme government is being formed with this guy, Ben Gavir, who used to have, I forget the guy's name, uh, but he used to have a picture of a terrorist on his, in his office that that killed a bunch of, you know, innocent Palestinians. Um, so, yeah, he's definitely bad news. And um, the situation is just getting more tense uh, in the West, the West Bank. I believe this year was has been the deadliest year for Palestinians in the West Bank for a long time. Uh, so uh, things aren't good there. Um, The next one, I just put this up because I thought it was interesting. So France and Germany and some other European countries are not happy with some recent legislation that has been passed by the Biden administration, including that Inflation Reduction Act, uh, if that's what it's called. Yeah, because it includes subsidies for for, uh, green energy and, and things like that. So they're worried that all the industry is going to be going to the U S because of these subsidies. And, you know, they're also, it's kind of a double whammy for Europe because the U S is enacting all these subsidies and fuel and energy and gas is a lot cheaper in the U S right now than Europe. So if you're a company and you want to build a factory and there's subsidies over in the U S and everything's so much cheaper, you'll probably pick that. So France's finance minister uh, accused the U S of pursuing a China style industrial policy Uh, basically saying that they're taking China's model of subsidizing uh, to boost domestic production. And now Europe is kind of going to turn into, it seems like maybe a little trade war between the U.S. and Europe. And uh, they're going to start, they're saying that they're going to start with their own subsidies. And it's not just the Inflation Reduction Act, it's also that CHIP Act that included 52 billion to subsidize domestic chip manufacturing. And it's funny, you know, it's uh, meant to counter China and they are turning more into China uh, by 
subsidizing stuff like this. And the Inflation Reduction Act, I don't know too much about it. I know that it's huge and that, you know, printing money generally causes, it does cause inflation. So I don't think it's going to really have the intended effect. But it's just another kind of aspect of how the Europeans aren't happy with the U.S., uh, but that's it for the news. Um, we have a lot of good viewpoints uh, linked from other sites. Um, so I'll so for uh, the next show, um, I plan on doing another show for tomorrow. It might be really slow. Um, I mean, you know, there's things going on around the world uh, that we will cover. But when it comes to like the American politics side of things, Thanksgiving is usually very very slow. So maybe if anything, um, if it's real slow, I'll just do like a quick. Uh, episode like 10 minutes or 15 minutes or something um but that's it everybody uh have a good day and uh i'll catch you tomorrow with some more news thanks for listening